Udan. So I'm going to share my slides. Um, okay, let's see how this is going to work. Um, presenter view. Okay. Uh, right, can you all see? Um, let me just. Okay. Can you all see the slides? Uda, I, I, I can I can just about see you. Would you mind uh, just giving me the thumbs up if that's if that's okay? Wonderful. Okay, so the context of the talk that I'm giving now is that um, I've been asked by a peace education project which is in Helsinki in um, Finland to um, write a piece and to give a talk in Helsinki to celebrate their 40th anniversary. Uh, this is sometime in November. I imagine I would be doing it on Zoom rather than going in, in person, although I, I have been invited. Um, and so I've been thinking about what I would say uh, for them. And that prompted me to think that this might also make quite a good first seminar uh, as part of our CPERG series. So, we're now for um, education and peace building. Um, again, apologies for those of you who are uh, well versed in this, but I, I, I just want to say that um, we often talk in CPERG about positive peace, which sounds a bit odd. What, what do we mean by positive peace? I will be talking about this in my lectures this year again, so if this is a bit quick, don't worry about it. But uh, positive peace is based around the ideas of Johan Goltum, who was first professor of peace studies in Norway in the 1970s. And he was challenged to think about what do we mean by peace? And he decided that he really couldn't define peace without thinking about violence. So he thought about uh, initially two and then three different forms of violence, one being direct violence um, and the other two being more indirect, structural and cultural violence. And he decided that negative peace is where we have the absence of direct violence. And we might use, for example, peacekeeping in order to stop direct violence. Positive peace, however, is where we go beyond that and where we look to remove structural and cultural violence. And we might achieve that through peacemaking and ultimately peace building, which is more proactive. So um, that's the framework for an awful lot of the work that's been done in the field of peace studies and therefore uh, the field of, of peace education. But I find myself at this point in time um, thinking that positive peace actually is still a response to um, violence. So in a way, although we talk about positive peace, it's, it's reactive. And I guess genuine positive peace would be um, peace which thought about what we positively want for uh, a peaceful environment and how education might contribute towards that. And so I've been thinking recently about um, utopia and um, lots of people have been writing about utopia in, in recent times. Um, so for example, uh, Slavov uh, Zizek, Peter Thompson, um, they've recently reviewed the work, the work of Ernst Bloch who wrote about hope in the late 1950s. And they suggest that hope has become mired in the excesses and dissatisfactions of contemporary capitalist society uh, due to the ways in which it's been atomized, uh, desocialized, and privatized. And they bring Bloch's uh, ontology of not yet being into conversation with 21st century concerns and attempt to revive a Blochian sense of, of hope, which I find um, very interesting in these new ideas about what positive peace might actually look like um, within the context of um, hope and uh, utopia. Um, likewise, Bernita Bagshi has written about the politics of the impossible in her book, uh, Utopia and Dystopia Reconsidered. Um, these are both uh, uh, books that I would uh, commend to you. Um, I am going to share this PowerPoint. I'll um, give it to Udai to put on our pages as, uh, alongside this presentation. So 
uh, if you're wanting to follow up with any of these references, they'll be in the notes section of the, of the PowerPoint. So where have we been in the field of education and peace studies? I've, I've just mentioned Galton in the middle of the 20th century. Um, a lot of the peace work began after the Second World War and in, in an attempt for to try to use education for a kind of a never again type agenda. How can we educate people to become more tolerant and to make sure that we don't end up with the atrocities of the uh, two world wars that happened in, in, in the 20th century? Um, around the end of the uh, 20th century in the um, 1990s, uh, the end of the Cold War, liberal peace building came into particular prominence. And uh, that was the idea that somehow uh, democracy and um, free trade would spread across the entire planet and thereby um, we would have peace because countries that trade together don't um, fight each other. So people like Boutros, Boutros Ghali writing in the UN, his UN report in 1992 um, was calling all nations to get involved with a good governance, democracy, and promoting this across the planet in all national and political communities. We've had um, a falling away uh, of those kinds of ideas in, in more recent times uh, with the liberal uh, peace agenda uh, falling off and um, with um, the impact of the financial crisis and long and expensive wars overseas, uh, resulting in um, kind of a fragmentation and a loss of confidence around the ideas of um, urban Western liberal ideas spreading across the entire planet. So as uh, uh, John uh, Carlswood in his 2019 book, From Liberal Peacemaking to Stabilization and uh, Counterterrorism, so that's an article in International Peacekeeping, uh, says, um, stabilization and counterterrorism are growing, for example, in parts of um, Africa. Um, and regional ad hoc coalitions are being sent up to fight terrorists and other armed uh, groups. But of course, there's a danger here of uh, oppressive governments and disillusioned people joining ranks of opposition and also joining um, terrorist groups or uh, counterinsurgency groups of, of various kinds. So we have a kind of a fragmentation, a lack of consensus, if you like, about uh, what global peace might look like and the disillusionment with the ideas after the second after the cold war of um, liberal peace building so where are we now um, we can perhaps revisit Galtung and his ideas around uh, stru stru uh, structural and cultural violence so we perhaps have new forms, uh, new in adverted comments, of uh, structural violence, global um, inequality. You only have to uh, Google places like um, websites like Oxfam, for example, uh, where I found a statistic yesterday that the world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. I mean, it takes a while to actually let that sink in. The richest 1% have more than twice as much as 6.9 billion people. Uh, men own more than 50% more of the world's wealth than women. And the unpaid care work done by women is estimated at $10.8 trillion a year, which is three times the size of the tech industry. Uh, here in the UK, despite the redistributive power of taxes and benefits, income inequality, as measured by the Gini coefficient for household income after taxes and benefits, um, show that the, um, the, the gap between the rich and the poor has um, increased over the last 10 years. So um, it's, it's been increasing by an average of uh, 0.2 percentage points per year. So despite all of our efforts, the, um, the sort of levelling up and talks about addressing inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor in the UK, as elsewhere in the world, is getting 
bigger, not smaller. We all know um, about the climate um, emergency. I don't need to say um, much more about the about the impact, but we know that we all, um, the, the climate emergency is already having serious impacts on the world's water systems through more flooding, droughts, extreme weather, and so on. And of course, climate inequality means that the poorest of the world are going to be the most affected, but have been the least involved in generating the problems in the first uh, place. That's something that's definitely going to be uh, a form of structural violence that we're going to need to tackle going forward. Um, new forms of cultural violence, of course, uh, colonialism and um, the move towards decolonizing, decolonizing the curriculum uh, and so on, extremely um, important. Uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, we have to think very, very differently about our assumptions, our norms, our history, the way that we think about how we um, live our lives. Uh, Post-truth is really interesting because an awful lot of our education and peace building work relied on the idea that somehow we could um, en encourage young people to become critical. To, to be able to learn what the truth is, to delve into um, behind the media and propaganda and so on, and to be convinced by the importance of, of peace through the powers of rationality and persuasion. And what we've found is that in a post-truth world, um, increasingly people are getting into silos and uh, believing what other people like them are likely to uh, believe. So Lee McIntyre um, in his book with um, MIT Press says that um, he defines post-truth as an assertion of ideological supremacy by which its practitioners try to compel someone to believe someone regardless of the evidence. But he points out that post-truth didn't begin with Trump and the 2016 uh, election. Um, the denial of scientific facts about smoking, evolution, vaccines, climate change, um, and so on have been with us um, for a while. And uh, he points out that this is uh, post-truth is so successful because of wired in cognitive biases that make us feel that our conclusions are based on good reasoning, even when they're not. Um, so the decline of traditional media, the rise of social media, the emer emergence of fake news as a political tool have created the ideal conditions of um, post-truth. And unfortunately, this means that um, some of the work that was done by uh, people on the left around um, deconstructing uh, norms and um, dominance, the, the assumptions of dominant groups, have now been taken on by right-wing groups. So they've borrowed the ideas of postmodernism, specifically the idea that there's no such thing as objective truth. And they've used similar techniques in their attacks on science and facts. So we find ourselves in a very messy place where it's hard to think about um, truth because it is so contested and people have so many different beliefs. And um, we've perhaps lost a sense by which we might begin to discriminate between different truths. Whose values, whose history, whose truth claims, whose rights, whose philosophies, whose perspectives. These all come into the messy arena of working out uh, truth, which means that if if you're, if you're trying to think about peace and peace education, it's very hard to do so unless we have some kind of consensus about what is true and good and peaceful. We clearly have um, a rise of nationalism. We have a rise of the right and of um, fascism. And uh, we also have identity wars, um, narcissism, um, in, interest in the issues around um, the self and identity where we are recognize ourselves as plural. So having multiple identities. So some of um, work around uh, research and development 
is going inwards and looking at intersecting aspects of identity within the individual, uh, rather than necessarily looking um, out outwards at um, interpersonal, intercultural and international conflict. So where are we at post pandemic? I've put post in uh, adverted commas, obviously. We uh, have new forms of structural violence here as well. So the World Health Organization has set a target, global target of 70% of the population of all countries to be vaccinated by mid 2022. Um, but we're nowhere near reaching that goals because we need more equitable access to vaccines. Um, as we know, there's an unequal risk of death and serious illness, and this can be impacted by poverty, by previous conditions, by um, ethnicity, um, and so on. The pandemic has had unequal economic impacts on people. Home working, for uh, example, um, some people are, are, are able to work from, from home, others aren't. The impacts of the virus have been um, uh, um, unequal across generations. And of course, we have a huge mental health crisis. These are all areas that education and peace building will need to address going forward. We also have um, new forms of, of cultural um, violence. Um, so there's a fantastic book by uh, someone called Laura Dodsworth. And it's a very quick and dirty book. She wrote it really quickly in 2021. She spoke to various um, policymakers and others around some of the politics behind the, uh, the lockdown. And um, I think the subtitle of the book is How Governments Weaponized Fear in the COVID-19 uh, Crisis. And um, she spoke about the, um, in particular, about the behavioural psychologists. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, looked at this in any, in any great depth, um, but there are behavioural psychologists now not in the UK, not just in the uh, behavioural insights team, but also more generally in all areas of government. And in actual fact, the UK is leading the world in um, behavioural science. So our government is, is now advising different governments across the world about how to use, um, should we call it uh, propaganda, in order to influence people. I mean, up to now, people haven't really been too concerned about this because we've, we thought about it as relatively benign, you know, around how can we give the right messages around health, for example, around healthy eating or giving up smoking uh, and so on. But as uh, Laura Dodsworth has shown during the COVID pandemic, behavioral scientists were central in um, manipulating the public at a population level in order to conform with um, the kinds of messaging that, that um, the government wanted. You could argue that at a population level, this is useful in order to um, encourage social distancing and so on. Um, but as the people that Laura Dodsworth um, interviewed have, have, have said, the virus is um, extremely uh, mild and unproblematic for the vast majority of the population, um, certainly in, um, in, 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 in the UK. Um, but in order to protect the NHS, which Boris Johnson was heavily invested in, um, it was necessary to lock up the healthy and um, to keep everybody socially distanced. And the main um, weapon that they used for this was, was fear. So uh, Mindspace is an acronym that's used in the Behavioral Insights team and uh, which uh, creates the various conditions that are necessary in order to manipulate behavior at a, at a population level. So you think about the messenger, so we, we are influenced by who conveys the information. You think about the incentives that you're offering to people, and in particular, people exhibit loss aversion. So the incentives that you need to offer um, need to lean into that. What might people fear losing? Um, people are influenced by what, by what others do. So you create the impression that everybody is, 
is, is doing it. Um, defaults, people are heavily influenced by what they see as the default uh, position. We particularly are influenced by, what, by what's visible and new. So advertisers have known this for a very, very long time. That's why when products are launched, they will very often have new on them because we buy things more if, if, if we think that what's being offered is, is new. Uh, you can use subconscious uh, cues um, as, as part of priming people to behave in particular ways. You can lean into emotions. Um, people will um, stick with um, commitments that they, that they have, have made, and they will act in ways that make them feel good about themselves. Now, some of these techniques are those that have been used over the years within education or within peace education in order to encourage people to think in particular ways about um, peaceful ways of, of living. Uh, we know, for example, that affect and emotion are important in our peace building work, feelings of trust and safety. Um, we try to encourage people to think about the kinds of people they want to be as they are thinking about um, peace building. And we also think about role models and how people can be very heavily influenced by who is conveying the messages around peace building. I think what I'm trying to say here is that we have to be aware that in education work, in policy work, in our political life, there are ways of getting across messages that will um, interact with our psychology um, in ways that can impact on behaviour. And it's all very well moving away from an idea of uh, rationality and persuasion and overly cognate methodologies, which, we, which we've been doing within the areas of, 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 of peace education, peace building. But we do need to think about what we're doing and also to be aware of how the same techniques can be used by the right, they can be used by different interest groups, they can be used to control populations. And um, we've just been through a period where these methods were used on us. Um, many people who really don't need to be fearful are incredibly fearful. We have a huge mental health crisis. Um, deaths from causes other than COVID are on the increase, some of which have been uh, exacerbated or caused uh, by, the, by the lockdown itself. The, the debate around what's happened to us in the last um, year, year or so, couple of years, has been very much influenced by um, the needs of policymakers to be seen to be doing the right thing. Um, again, I, I had mask wearing on the previous slide, Masks have very little effect. Um, clinical masks have a very small amount of, of have, have effect, but the kinds of masks that we all wear, for example, in the faculty building, make very, very little difference to the uh, transmission of, of the virus. The virus can very easily get through um, cloth worn on our faces. Um, but we wear masks in, in order to show, to show solidarity. And um, they, I think the, the, the most recent studies around um, clinical masks showed that they reduced infection rates by um, a few percentage. Um, so there, there are some very marginal um, effects. It might stop us from touching our faces if we've, if we've touched our surfaces and so on. But we're, we're living in a time where the need to show commitment, the need to show solidarity, the need to be seen to be doing something uh, has, has been brought about by these very powerful psychological techniques, um, both here and elsewhere in the world. And we, just, we just need to be aware of that. If we're critical peace educators, we perhaps need to take a step back and have a little look at the way that we've all been affected by a uh, manipulation of, of science and evidence in recent times. So um, we're now for peace building. The most uh, recent trends are towards, for example, everyday peace and the local term. So thinking about, thinking about peace, not necessarily from the point of view of um, an international peace agenda, but what peace looks like 
in people's everyday lives and in particular uh, localities. There's a turn towards care and towards feminized perspectives around peace building. Um, feminist materialism, the importance of things, the way that objects and the material world interacts with our lives. Um, people are moving away from anthropocentric ways of, of thinking about the world, particularly because of ecological concerns. So what, how might we understand other species and, and their needs as we, as, as we think about uh, peace in the world? Embodied peace, how do we experience peace in our bodies? Uh, we're hoping that Norbert Koppensteiner might be coming to, to speak with us um, very soon. And he talks about peace through dance, learning and self-expression through going inwards and as, as well as through field work and empirical studies out in the world. We have the work of Wolfgang Dietrich who talks about many different pieces and in particular he talks about the needs to bring in um, perspectives around um, harmony and um, energy oriented traditions which have been much neglected in global dis uh, discourse around peace. So perspectives from Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism um, and indigenous perspectives, for example. Um, and, and then movements like the slow movement, the degrowth movement, the small movement um, are all important to counteract some of the worst excesses of modernity that have created this impression that we can bring peace to the world through the urban liberal peace agenda, through capitalism, through um, colonialism and, and, and so on. These, these, these movements are, are pushing back at what the good life might look like away from mo modernist preoccupations with growth, the growth mindset. So um, we're now for peace education specifically. Uh, my latest work is around concepts of rewilding. So this is about how we can go from the sort of agro business ideas around modernity, where everything is um, in monocultures and straight lines and where technology has a solution for everything, over to ideas of rewilding and culture where we trust ecosystems to find a level and where we take our place within those systems alongside other species and um, where we think again about what the good life might look like. Um, so we might need to think about new ways of learning, knowing and being. Uh, so new ideas around science, for example, and curiosity. So Robert Kimmerer, in his book, uh, recommended to me by one of my PhD students, uh, Namisha, his book, Braiding Sweetgrass, blends um, botany with Native American mythology and natural history and philosophy. Uh, some of you might know the work of uh, Rancière, Le Maître Ignorant, who uh, wrote about how Sometimes when you don't know something, you make the best teacher. How can we take our place of not knowing alongside our students and co-discover with them, particularly because we have no idea what kind of world we are um, seeking to create for the 21st century? Can we have humility? Can we, can we le learn alongside? Um, the art and aesthetics, for example, the work of David Diamond, his work on theater for the living, um, who, he extends the work of Boal by taking a systems perspective and blurs the boundaries between oppressor and oppressed. So uh, Fritzjof Capra, in his prologue to this book, notes that um, any, any advance in scientific understanding of life comes from the realization that creativity is inherent in all li living systems. When systems encounter a point of instability, emergent properties often result. They can, be, they can be seen as supremely creative and as a response to critical moments. Diamond talks about the role of the joker in the theatre of the living. The role is to create a working space where it's safe for the group to enter disequilibrium. Creativity emerges from collective disturbance. When communities are seen as living systems, it's possible to work with networks of communication that are highly complex, non-linear and dynamic. Uh, Lederach 
his book on the moral imagination is truly uh, inspirational. He points out that violence often arises from the inability of individuals and groups to imagine themselves in a web of relationships that includes their enemies. Violence can be transcended by the awareness of this complex web of uh, relationships. And um, Bell Hooks, for example, talks about embodied ways of knowing. She talks about her lived experience as a black female academic and how she's constantly aware of her body in, way, in ways that, for example, white males um, aren't. She calls for a reclaiming of the body in order to work against dualism. This, acknowledge, this involves acknowledging the place of eros or the erotic in classrooms in order to invigorate discussion and excite the critical imagination. Uh, Norbert uh, Koppensteiner sees dance as a central metaphor for research, which seeks to reposition research and facilitation as truly experiential processes where the entirety of human experience and epistemology can be brought into interplay, opening up, opening up new sources of knowledge. These new sources are not just cognitive, but also embodied, emotional, intuitive, relational and spiritual. Um, I'm going to race on here because I've realised that we are running out of time. I'm sorry, Uday, um, but just to say that nature-based paradigms are really important to um, replace some of the uh, modernist paradigms that we've lived our lives by. So, for example, uh, Bill Plot Plotkin's book, Nature and the Human Soul, is really interesting. He introduces eco-psychology and the eco-psychology of uh, human development. So um, he works with Native um, American ways of uh, thinking about the life course. Um, so he sees it as rooted around cycles, um, which are rooted in the natural world. Um, so his book, for example, identifies eight stages of human life, starting with the innocent, the explorer, the, explorer, the thespian, the wanderer, the sole apprentice, the artisan, the master and the sage, and describes the challenges and benefits of each and the importance of ritual and of moving between these stages so as not to drag along inappropriate life stages into the next life stage. And he offers a way of progressing from our current egocentric, aggressively competitive consumer society to an eco-centric, soul-based one that is sustainable, cooperative and compassionate. Um, if you're interested, John Miller talks about uh, compassion and the wild teacher and uh, Duncan, his book Nature in Mind, talks about the weird culture, Western, educated, industrial, rich and democratic, which are at the heart of the developed world and which has a detrimental effect on ecosystems and on human health and well-being. He draws on the work of Gregory, Gregory Bateson and Henry Corbin, amongst others, to show how an understanding of the imaginal world within the practice of systemic psychotherapy and eco-psychology could provide a language shared by both nature and mind. Duncan's been both a Steiner teacher and nature-based uh, educator and I, it's a book that I would recommend. So um, finally then we need to think about new communities and uh, new social contracts. So we have in the world um, denizens, refugees, people who are not part of any um, um, particular nationality. And so our old social contracts that were based around nation states are beginning to run um, thin. What are our obligations to other people of the world? And how can we move into the 21st century in ways where we don't just draw up the drawbridge and accumulate resources and keep people out. This is a real risk, particularly with the climate emergency. We need to think about how we can educate people to think of the other as a brother or a sister, regardless of where they live. And that may mean some really hard thinking about how dominant groups might need to think again about what they feel they're entitled to or the ways in which they can work with other people um, in the world. And the principles of eco-psychology might help us in thinking about that. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Hilary, uh, for this uh, presentation. And um, I would like to maybe, uh, Roy, would you like to facilitate this uh, Q&A or would you like me to uh, continue? We're a, we're a self-organizing unit, so you decide. We can, all, we can do it um, together. Um, I, would, uh, I would ask uh, everyone, if you have any question, please, you can either raise uh, your hand or, or you can type in uh, a question in, in the chat. Um, I have a question for you, Hilary, but I'll, I'll wait to see. I'll give the platform to someone else maybe to ask a question first to see. Um, it would also be helpful for us for if uh, everyone who's listening to, the, to this um, just to post a few thoughts, even if you don't want to post a question, it would be helpful for us to get your ideas and feelings generally, even if it's just a word or a phrase, for us to sort of get a, a sense of how Hillary's um, presentation landed with you. And that would be really helpful. So, and what I will do, I'll stop also the recording uh, here. Okay.